Aum. Agyanang manasopade kartritvadini chatmani kalpyantem bugate chandre chalanadi yatang basaha Agnanat through ignorance, manasa upade of the upadi of the mind, kartritvadini agency of action, etc. Cha and atmani on the self, kalpyante attribute, ambugate which is reflected in the water. Chandre in the moon, Chalana Adi moving, etc. Yata just as Ambhasaha of the water. Through ignorance, movements of the waters are attributed to the reflected moon dancing on it. Likewise, agency of action, of enjoyment, and other limiting adjuncts which really belong to the mind, are delusively misunderstood as the nature of the self, Atman. Namaste. So here we are again talking about the relativity of consciousness. Well, what is the relativity? Einstein talked about it in his theory of general relativity, that Everything is measured relative to something else. In the old days, pre-Einstein, it was assumed that the base or the context in which everything is perceived is the Earth. In Newtonian physics, you know, or uh, plane geometry, for example, the Earth is the assumed reference point against which everything is measured and perceived. But Einstein said, no, no, we have to specify the reference point. Otherwise, there's no certainty as to what is moving and what is still. He gave the example of being in a railway car, in a train, in a station, now, you know, when a train starts off in the station, it moves very, very slowly. There's no sense of acceleration. The only way you know you're moving is by looking out at the platform, isn't it? So, what if you have another train on the next track, and then you're not looking at the platform, you're looking at the other train? And you see that train begin to move. Now the question arises, are you moving? Is your train starting up or is the other train starting up? Which train is moving? Which train is still? Well, you don't know until you check back with the platform because the platform is the reference that determines whether you're moving or not. This is relativity. This is the astounding discovery that shook the world. <laughs> because everybody up until that point simply assumed that the reference is the earth. The context. See? By the context, the relativity of everything is determined. So, which is the foreground? Which is the background? Which is the reference and which is the variable? See, what is the thing that can change and what is the thing that always remains still? And of course, in our explanations of consciousness, it's Brahman that always remains still, unchanging, without qualities, etc., and then all the other phenomena that come and go are measured relative to Brahman. And this is the fact of existence itself. 
We don't know whether or not something exists unless we're conscious of it. And consciousness is Brahman. Brahman, as is, is said in the Upanishads, is pure consciousness. What does that mean? It means consciousness without an object. Absolute, unchanging, infinite consciousness. So when that infinite consciousness comes into contact with phenomena that arise, persist, and disappear that Brahman becomes the context in which all the phenomena are understood, up to and including the entire universe, the entire creation. It's all understood in the context of consciousness. This is the Vedic view, especially the Upanishadic view. But in our common, ignorant, worldly frame of view, it's the other way around. We think the world is the context and that consciousness arises within it, isn't it? This is the so-called common sense view. <laughs> and it's wrong. It's completely wrong. It's backwards. But why is that? Well, we've often made the point that when you look at yourself in the mirror, the right and left are reversed. And similarly, because consciousness is reflected in the mind and body, there is also a reversal, but it's a reversal of context, of cause and effect. So the world appears to be the context. It appears to be the frame and consciousness appears like the picture, or in the example given in this verse. The waters seem to be moving because the moon is dancing on them. This is a very naive point of view. Anyone with a little sense or a little knowledge of physics <laughs> immediately sees through it that, oh, no, actually the water is moving and that is causing the reflection of the moon to dance. So, this is a reversal of cause and effect, foreground and background, context and content, or meaning. Context determines meaning. I often joke that if I was a pirate, I'd have a little parrot on my shoulder trained to say, context is meaning. <laughs> Rock, <laughs> Because this is such an important point of view, to be aware of the relationship between context and content. For example, if I say, let's climb up the hill, the word up means in or into a higher position, a higher altitude. But if I say, fill up the glass with water. Up has a completely different meaning. It means in or into a position, condition, or state of fullness or completion. By the way, you should know all of these definitions of common words. Up, I think, has uh, 23 different definitions, depending on what? The context. So, this is the thing that determines the meaning of any word, any phrase, or any thought, or even a perception. The context, which means the frame, that which we assume to be still, that in reference to which we measure everything. See, so this is the point. If we consider consciousness to be something arising in the context of the world, then it looks like the world or some physical reaction of some kind is the cause of consciousness. But actually, this is impossible <laughs> because the actual context is that consciousness is the frame and the world is the phenomenon arising within it. 
that gives the world, the, our experience in the world, and our experience as a self in the world, a completely different meaning. And this meaning that consciousness is the frame, consciousness is the context, and the world is the phenomenon, is the picture within the frame, the movement within this still frame of consciousness. This is the context that leads to self-realization. The reverse, the reflection of consciousness in the world, only leads to ignorance and more ignorance and still more ignorance and rebirth. This is samsara. Samsara is due to this view that consciousness arises in the frame of the world. And liberation is due to the view that the world arises in consciousness, which is actually our experience. If we just look at it, huh? the world arises when? When we arise, when we wake up from sleep, then the world is seen. But when we go back to sleep, the world disappears. And similarly, the dream world arises when we're in sleep, and it disappears when we awake. So, what is the world? It is the effect of consciousness. When consciousness changes, the world changes from the ordinary world to the dream world, from the material world to the mental world, from the world of the senses to the world of the mind and the imagination, dreams. Consciousness, therefore, is the active force that causes these changes in the apparency of the world. And when we enter sushupti, deep sleep, all the worlds disappear, all phenomena disappears. Also the mind and the body. Mmm, spice tea. So, we have to consider when analyzing any phenomena, what is the frame what is the context in which this phenomenon arises? So, for example, when we see the reflection of the moon in the water, what is the background? What is the foreground? See? What is the frame and what is the movie? We have to know this. Otherwise, we'll get the meaning wrong. And if we misunderstand the meaning, well... That's the definition of ignorance, isn't it? We misunderstand the meaning of our experience. We're thinking that, oh, this body is myself, this world is my home, and consciousness arises as some kind of epiphenomenon of the brain function. <laughs> it's so idiotic because it leads to misunderstanding the meaning of everything else, of everything then perceived by that consciousness in that context. So again, context determines meaning. If my context is that aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, simply I am being conditioned by Jiva Tvam Upadhi, the covering or the limiting adjunct that I am a conditioned soul born in the world. Then, when phenomena arise, no matter whether they're pleasant or distressful or neutral, huh, I view them in a different way. I measure them in a different way than if I think that this world is the context and the phenomena are real, isn't it? 
So this is where the scientists go wrong. This is where everybody go, loses the thread. Huh? Because Maya is very powerful, and it makes us think that, oh, this world is real. This body is me. And all my experiences are really happening to me. And then we measure everything in that context. And what does it mean? We suffer. We suffer because nothing ever goes exactly the way we want. And everything is temporary. Even if we get what we want, it's going to go away. Or it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> and even if it is perfect, it's still temporary. So this is the difference. But when we measure it in the context of Brahman and consciousness, there is no suffering. Because suffering has to happen to somebody, to something. And I am not this. Neti neti. I am that. Aham Brahmasmi. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti. Aung Namah Shivai.